Get, got audio? All right. Um, well, as we said, we'll be talking about uh, lessons learned from a bug bounty operator today. Uh, a little bit about me first. Uh, I joined Mozilla about a year ago. I uh, hit my one year anniversary about one month ago, so a little over a year. And I've been in the IT and security space for about 15 years, doing mostly offensive work, but I've also done some defensive work as well. Uh, offense has sort of been a specialty of mine, and uh, it's been an exciting time for that. Uh, at Mozilla, I'm the product owner for security assessments, so I spend a lot of my time doing risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, threat modeling exercises, and most importantly, penetration testing. So those keep me pretty busy, uh, but when I'm not doing those things, I'm working on the Mozilla Bug Bounty Program. Uh, working with security researchers, day in, day out, filing, uh, fielding bugs that are coming in for our products and services, working with development teams to try and fix those vulnerabilities, and getting researchers paid for their contributions. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for that piece. What I want to talk about today, uh, there's truly two main things that I want to hit home, two things I'd like to leave you with. One is if you're going to be operating a bug bounty program, what are some good techniques that you can do to really make your program work well? And then also, if you're considering, as a, like a security researcher, wanting to participate in a program as a bounty hunter, here are some strategies for you to do that better. At least, what, what am I seeing from bounty hunters that are really successful in our program? There's a couple background bits of information that I'll be sharing with you before we get to that point, but that's where I'd like to leave you today. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, what is a bug bounty program? Uh, what is a bug bounty? When I think about this topic, uh, I think about how I want to explain this to my parents. Um, they don't understand anything that I do when it comes to security. Uh, so I have to think about how I'm going to relate to them and how am I going to bridge the gap to help them understand what this thing is. Uh, can I get a quick raise of hands for those of you that know what a bug bounty is or have participated in a bug bounty? Okay about half. Um, well, the way I think about it is I just go to the root of the word. You know, what is a bounty? Um, in this case, uh, think about it as when you were a child, you have a pet, a dog, a cat, whatever, and that pet runs away or you get that pet is lost. You think about what are the things that you would do when you need to retrieve that animal. You would go to the community to ask them for help, right? Because you only have yourself, you can only be in so many places, but your dog or pet might be, you know, miles away. So what you do is you write up this reward, and you say, uh, my pet's lost, I need help, Here, here's what the pet looks like, here are the details about the pet, here's how you get in touch with me. Here's how you let me know uh, and help me retrieve that animal. Well, when I think about it in terms of bug bounty programs, in this case the puppy, in this case is a security vulnerability. We're asking other people to help us find something. We're engaging the community to get help finding something that we couldn't find on our own. And the way that organizations do that is by describing public intent to pay security researchers for finding security bugs in their platforms. It's not an engagement. It's not a consulting engagement where we have a very clear task. This is an open challenge to the world to say, please come hack on our stuff will pay you for security vulnerabilities that you find that are impactful for our products and services. And the way that we do that at Mozilla, uh, much like other organizations, instead of providing that uh, piece of paper that we would nail to uh, like a telephone pole or pl plaster all around town, we put out a public website that basically says, Here is the, here's our intent. Here are the guidelines for how someone would participate in our program. And the reason why we need to do Am I getting feedback? OK. Um, so one of the reasons why we describe the program in, in the way that we do is that if we relate back to that puppy scenario with your lost pet, we don't exactly know what these bugs look like. We don't exactly know what the bugs are. If we knew, we'd fix them ourselves. Um, so the, reason, the goal for the, the, the bounty program is to ensure that we provide an, enough guidance to get people involved to know that they are actually finding things that we care about and also give them some sort of sense that they're actually going to get paid at the end of it. 
there's actually going to be some reward for participating in the program. So I want to touch a little bit on history, but I'm going to grab some water first because I'm getting dry. So a little bit about bug bounty history. Um, if we think back to 1995, uh, Netscape was one of the first bug bounty programs out there providing bug bounties for bugs found in Netscape. And when that organization ceased to exist and was purchased by AOL, the browser source code uh, was open sourced and it translated into the Mozilla organization. Eventually became Firefox. Um, but at that time, Mozilla was basically one of the early bounty programs at the time. And uh, Mozilla sort of sees itself as one of the early pioneers of bug bounty programs. At, the, at that time, there really weren't a lot of other bug bounty programs out there. And what we've seen is over the years, we're getting more and more people participating in bug bounty programs, more organizations creating their own bug bounty programs to get help on security issues that they couldn't solve on their own. We even have organizations out there like Bug Crowd, the organization that actually created this diagram, I stole it from their website, and HackerOne, that are more or less like facilitation engines. My phone is ringing. Um, they're facilitation engines for helping organizations that don't have the resources or the setup to create their own bug bounty program on their own. So these organizations, specifically Bug Crowd and HackerOne and those alike, are really helping make bug bounty programs extremely mainstream. So a lot of organizations are running their own bug bounty programs, working with the community, helping res or getting, help, getting help from research, researchers that, uh, that get paid for finding vulnerabilities in their products. It's really bothering me. Can I turn this off? Can I just go no audio? Can you Okay, well, it's really irritating. Um, is that bothering you guys too? All right. Oh, it's this one? All right. Well, I'm going to continue on. I just was hoping that maybe we could solve that. Um, so why would an organization run a bug bounty program? Why is it becoming much more popular for people to start participating and creating their own bounty programs to get researchers engaged. Um, for me, it's, it's pretty simple, but some organizations might say, well, I don't want to run a bounty program because I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to put my software in, in, the, in the limelight and have it be risk of finding vulnerabilities and be, being an embarrassment. Um, so I think a lot of organizations think that way, um, but there is reasons why why organizations are successfully getting bounty programs and using them within their, uh, within their security program. So the first thing, uh, at least for me, uh, at Mozilla, one of, the one of the most important things to us are securing our users. So when you think about the value of a bug bounty program, I think about how is it going to protect my users um, and eliminate security risks within my product. In this particular case, uh, we find that it really does help reduce some of the zero-day risk that we have within products. So if, we, if a security researcher is going to find a bug in our product, and they're, gonna, they're most likely going to find bugs in products, like software vulnerabilities are going to exist, at least we're providing them an avenue to work with us and get rewarded and paid through an approved, approved channel. And if we do that and we provide that avenue, we really do reduce our risk of someone going out there and just going for a publicity stunt on a block. The next one is community. Uh, Mozilla is really keen on creating communities and getting people engaged in our products and services. Um, so as part of the bug bounty program, we get to tap this huge pool of resources of security researchers that are interested in our products and willing to help us find vulnerabilities in those products. And in a way, everyone sort of brings their own piece to the puzzle. Like Everyone has their own experiences and background. And having all this put together really does help us find security vulnerabilities in our products and resolve them quicker than we would have been able to do if we, if we didn't have a bounty program. Um, the other aspect of this is confidence. Um, and it's twofold. It's the confidence that you have in your product and ensuring that you feel you've done as much as you possibly can with the resources that you have to fix, find and fix vulnerabilities in the product. Um, but there's more to that. It's also like a maturity thing. 
in the sense that you feel comfortable enough to be able to put yourself out there and say as an organization that you're mature enough and willing to compensate security researchers to help you find and fix bugs and you're open to that discussion and you're willing to participate. I can tell you that as a uh, person at Mozilla that evaluates products and services that we would use within our organization, the other aspect to this is confidence in other people's products that I'm, that I'm purchasing and using. Is there any way to kill the sound? All right. OK. Um, I can see you guys all wincing in the, in the back, back, background. Um, so I'll keep going. So why would you want to participate in a bounty program? So this is the other side of it. Uh, we, have a, we have a program. We've decided that there's a reason to do a bounty program. But what about the people that want to participate in our program? Why do they participate in our program? What are the motives for them? And one of them, I, I don't know if you would all guess this, but for me, this really hits home for me as, like a, as, a, as a self-defined hacker. A lot of people participate in our program just because they're curious. They want to look in those dark spaces. They want to take something, put it on the bench, take it apart, take all the screws out of it, lay it on the table, and understand how it works. Um, so we get a lot of people that participate in our bug bounty program. They submit security vulnerabilities to us, but those people aren't seeking bounties. So in a lot of cases, they're surprised when they receive a bounty, or they're, they're being engaged to provide payment for something that they, they didn't think they were otherwise going to get paid for. So that's one big one. The next one I think is going to be pretty obvious um, is money. A lot of people start m making a lot of money doing bug bounty programs. Uh, bug bounty programs started off as like single dollar amounts, small dollar amounts, hundred dollars, thousand dollars, and nowadays you can pull easily, not easily, but you can pull bounty numbers as the high as hundreds of thousands of dollars. So people are making full-time living, making, uh, submitting bugs to these bounty programs, um, and it's become a big business. And I think over, at least in the last couple years, we've seen a lot more people coming and working with us that are full-time bounty hunters. The other aspect of that is fame. Uh, a lot of organizations provide uh, Hall of Fame pages to indicate those researchers that they've worked with that have really helped them and done a lot for the program. And researcher, the, the gamification of that, like making it a game uh, to try and be on the top, like to be the best, security researchers really identify with that and they want to be on the top. They want to be the top 10 on that particular program. And that also translates to career development. Uh, if you are the top on that particular program, you can uh, you you have something on your resume on your um, CV that really differentiates you from other people in the market. And as far as also to career development, we have a number of people that work in our program that are college students. So they're people that are just starting to enter the market, um, and they don't have these skills yet. So they they have their their, their classroom activities, but in addition to that. They're using the bug bounty program to really cut their teeth and start to learn how to operate um, on, a, on, on a scale that major organizations want to compensate them for. So in, in some ways, we use the program to identify top talent that we want to bring onto our team and want to bring in, bring, bring in house and full-time uh, full make them part of our team. Um, so that's just the kind of the beginning stage here to get us started. Uh, some of the reasons why someone would run a bounty program, why bug bounty programs are important. Uh, this is my indicate to segue to the next section uh, <laughs> um, into how do we run a good bounty program. And I feel like that's something that we do well at Mozilla. Uh, so I feel like I feel pretty good that uh, we've, we've got a lot of those aspects within our program today. Uh, and that there's always times where we're really trying to improve on the program. We're trying to look at it from a bunch of different angles to make sure that we're being competitive. Part of this is getting mind share from security researchers. If we can be an interesting program to them, we provide enough interesting targets for them, we've got their time and interest to come play on the program. Uh, so one of the big things that I think is really important about having a good bounty program is working with a bounty committee or ha establishing a committee within the, your team that would 
help govern that program. And we do that at Mozilla. We have a group of about five or six people that meet every week, and we discuss all the existing open bounties, what the risk levels are, and if the risk levels are high enough, well, whether that person's going to receive a bounty. So these people are like your mind share. So if you, you, need, you, want, you want highly technical people, and you also want people that are going to be part of the organization. So they understand the products and services that you're offering, and they understand the impact if one of those products or services have a critical vulnerability that would impact the, its abilities to deliver to a customer. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect of that is doing bounty triage. Um, it's really important to, one, have a bounty program, but it's really detrimental if you don't respond to researchers in a timely way. Um, so it, in this regard, the important aspect here is to get to that researcher as soon as possible. So they submit to us, we have to maintain an SLA to work with that researcher within 24 hours. So they're not submitting a bug to us, it goes into a black hole, and then they hear from us from six months and say, hey, here's a bounty. It doesn't work that way. Um, in our bounty, the way we operate it, we're, we're responding to people within one business day. In some case, we're responding to them within minutes of submitting. Um, that generally depends on availability of the person that's doing the triage. But the important thing as do, in doing triage is not necessarily for you to fix the vulnerability and get that person paid immediate, immediately. The issue is for us to assess the impact of that particular vulnerability to the organization. Because if the impact is really high, it means that we need to rally the troops, we need to get people involved, and we need to be part of that discussion immediately and start getting all the people in there to fix the, fix the vulnerability and get that thing sorted out. You'll see on some of the slides here as we go through that I've including examples. One of the things that we do at Mozilla is that we're a really open organization. So whenever we have a process or a technique or a thing that we do, we try to share that openly with the community so that you can look at it, you can critique it, you can help us improve it. Um, or you could use it for yourself if you're operating your own uh, bug bounty program. Here's some tips and things on how we do it. We do a, a daily rotation. So there's a single person like myself that might be on any given day. When a vulnerability comes in, I'd triage that vulnerability and work it to its completion. And then the next day we switch off to another person. And the reason why we do that is because bugs can come in at any time of the day. Uh, so we don't want, we want some, that triage person to be fresh ready to go so that when that vulnerability comes in, they're ready to rock and start working the issue. Uh, the other thing that's really, really helpful in having a bug bounty program is establishing a severity level, uh, or severity levels, a ranking scale, if you will, for how you're going to assess vulnerabilities. It can be as simple as this, uh, just high, medium, low. You can have interim levels. Um, you can even have it match your existing risk process within your organization. If you talk to someone in your organization, the risk organization, they might already have an established uh, set of criteria. It's really important to standardize those and in the sense that when it comes to the bounty committee assessing a given vulnerability for its impact to the organization, how is, an or how is that person going to eventually get paid? We're doing it in a pretty stable way. So like remote code execution in this particular piece of code equals this. Um, it makes those conversations with the bounty committee when they're assessing whether or not a, a, a vulnerability is going to be paid. It makes that process move a little bit smoother. So it adds grease to the wheels, if you will. Um, I also have an example of our severity ratings here below. You're welcome to look at that on your own and see what we're using. Um, I think it's not so much important that you use our scale because even this slide right here is not our own. It's just that you establish a scale so that you can set a bar for payment. Um, and we, we set our payment around like the middle of the road, about halfway, um, so that when people start hitting that, that, that threshold, they're starting to get paid. And if they find critical vulnerabilities, they're going to get paid a substantial amount more money. Um, another thing that's important about running a bounty program as an operator is that you have to acknowledge the people that are participating in the program. When some, so someone submits a bug, you want to always thank them, regardless of whether or not you know that bug's going to be paid, or whether that bug's a duplicate, or whether it's not even a bug at all. It's important to make sure that we're validating the folks that are coming in and participating in the program so that they, even if they struck out, that they can come back and like save some dignity and they're not feeling embarrassed that they submit something that didn't matter to us or that wasn't really important to us. Um, because we do value their contribution and it's important that you do that because 
those are the people that are going to come back and participate in the program and probably find the most interesting bugs. In a case where a bug is awarded a bounty, uh, I, I'm a firm believer that it needs to be paid out as soon as possible. And when we do that, we really we start a, a feedback engine with that, that individual and they get an indication that we're serious about security vulnerabilities in our products. And what ends up happening is when we do this and we, and we execute on this quickly, we end up with like a flurry of that, that, that person, if they're new to the program, they tend to really work with this a lot. So it's like so someone's first time in the program, they submit a bug to us, we immediately pay them, and then it's like six or seven more bugs right after that. So you can really, really drive participation by getting a successful result under the table, and that person knows that you're running a serious program. Uh, so patience. So this is the not so great part of a program. Um, sometimes when you're operating a program you get these great bugs and they're perfectly documented and you have exact POCs and everything's perfect. Um, this is not the, that case. Um, so there's cases where we get offensive language, we get misunderstandings about the circumstances of a given bug. And oh, we've got our speaker going on again. Um, we get ransom videos uh, <laughs> of people trying to explain the bug to us and it takes you to like the 29th minute before you actually see the bug. Um, so that's always exciting. We have demands for payment and just straight up like disrespect. Um, and I'll get into one or two more examples of that later as we go. I think it's important as you're, if you're operating in a bug bounty program that you keep your patience. Uh, or the, I'm sorry, that you keep it cool and you keep it professional. There's people that have thrown all kinds of terrible things my way in operating the bounty program uh, in some of the bad submissions. And it's important for us to just sort of keep cool, work through it, uh, try to stay professional. Because there's times where we've taken someone that was like a really bad submitter, like someone that's just driven us nuts in, in the bounty program. It's like 50 bugs in one day. They're all low risk and they don't matter to us particularly. Um, and we've been able to convert those people just by being nice and staying patient with them and working through the process and educating them about the things that we're looking for. So uh, I think that's a really critical aspect for operating a bounty. Transparency and openness. Um, I think as Mozilla, this comes really easy for us because we operate in the open on a lot of the stuff that we work on. Uh, I think the, the important part here is to have a process where you can communicate what the program is and how it works, but I think it's also important to involve security researchers as part of the workflow in solving the problem. Um, so what we do at Mozilla is we use a system called Bugzilla. It's just a ticketing system. Uh, when a bug comes in, uh, we obviously have to keep it private um, until we fix that vulnerability. But while we're working through that vulnerability, the researchers engage with us. Uh, we have the developer engaged. We have myself or one of the other triage people involved. So we're all working together trying to solve the same problem in the same workspace. So there's no additional communication. There's no, I tell this guy and then I got to go work with this guy. It all happens in the same bug. The security researcher sees that we're actively working on it. And it really helps in a lot of ways to prevent that sort of case where someone's saying, well, where is this bug? Like, where is it in your process? Are you working on this? You, is this important to you? In a lot of ways, it just says right up from the get-go that, that it is important to us. We are actively working through the issue, and they're part of the solution. Um, and we, what we also do is we take that full conversation, like everything that we communicated about when we're done with the bug and it's fixed, we'll open source that bug. Um, so you can see the full discussion, you can see what our development said, you can see what I said, you can see what the, the security researcher said, and for me that, that really, really helps um, show other security researchers how we work, and it also gives them indications as to where we might have other problems in other parts of our software that they can go and attack and get bounties for. So in a way it's like little breadcrumbs we're sprinkling around about where our problems are, which is which is bad, right? We have problems, but um, the other aspects of that is that it gives other people good indications as to if we didn't solve the problem completely, here's another place where you can look. Um, and we have had cases where, where we, saw, we thought we had solved an issue. Security researchers saw a public a bug that had been recently publicized and said, well, what about over here? What about this application? 
and it really keeps us honest in a way, and I feel like that's a uh, really uh, helpful part of running a good pro program. Um, this, if, if there is anything that I say today about running good opera uh, operating a good bug bounty program, uh, this to me is one of the most important things. And it's not the public aspects of it, it's about taking the feedback that you get from security researchers, looking at them at a higher level and trying to identify trends of bugs and why you're, why you're faced with these certain bugs and trying to develop uh, guidelines and procedures to really start to catch those bugs and knock out entire classes of vulnerabilities. And we've done that. Um, I've got a couple links here. I don't think it's showing up very well. Um, but we've developed uh, TLS guidelines for SSL. We've de developed uh, guidelines for open, uh, for open SSH, as well as our web, uh, our web security guidelines. So those things really helped us take entire vulnerabilities or classes of vulnerabilities off the map in, a, uh, in terms of remediation. Sorry, guys. Oh, it stopped when you opened the door. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so developing these programs or developing these guidelines really helped us make our program better. And anytime you're operating a program, if you're not looking at the issues that are coming in and trying to identify trends and common issues that come back to you over and over and over again and trying to fix them at a higher level, you're missing value in the program. Like you're leaving, you're missing stuff that um, would be really, really important to, to advance the program. And what we see with our program is that uh, by doing this, we're not dealing with the same bugs year over year. We tend to have a, like a, a wave where like if cross-site scripting was important earlier this year, we've addressed it with CSP and specific technologies. We're basically that bug class is gone, so now we're off onto some other tangent. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the later slides as far as like how to do a good bounty hunter, how to be a good bounty hunter, and how you can sort of chase along with us um, and make it effective for yourself. Uh, and I guess that's a good segue into that aspect of it. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing with good bounty hunters. Uh, what are they doing? What what are, what are they doing that's so different that, that differentiates a good bounty hunter from a bad bounty hunter? Um, and I, I, I don't mean to say that there's any bad bounty hunters, but there's certainly levels of experience and quality that we experience in the program, and I want to highlight the ones that we really enjoy. Uh, the first one I think is pretty obvious. Um, if you're going to submit a bug to a bug bounty program, you need to have a POC. You need to have a proof of concept that demonstrates the bug. Um, I we get these, uh, I would say, on most submissions, so I think this is pretty obvious. Um, what we don't see on some submissions uh, is safe reproduction steps, which I think is really important uh, for, for when you're submitting those bugs to the bounty program. You know, if, you're, if your POC throws a shell to your remote machine, it doesn't really bode a lot of like, goodwill to the people that are operating the program. Like, oh, OK, you're trying to throw a shell on my machine, great. Um, so these are the sort of things that um, are interesting. Uh, I don't think people consider them uh, as, as issues, but for me, it's important that we're providing a safe way of communicating. So in a lot of ways, if you're giving me some proprietary format, there's additional steps that I need to do. So if you can give me something as text and make it clear, um, and you can demonstrate the bug with an, with just with a picture and show it to me, um, usually it helps sort of move things along quickly. Um, what, what I think is also important here is that you also want to describe why it's an issue. I think a lot of times when we're doing technical security exploit work, we think about the class of the vulnerability and why that class is important. Uh, but it's really important to understand the potential impact of that vulnerability to the organization. If you can connect as a bounty hunter with an organization's impact, an impact to their bottom line, you are going to get better bounties out of, that, out of that program. You can draw that connection for them uh, that they wouldn't otherwise been able to draw on their own. Uh, you can really do uh, a lot of crazy things. The, yeah, and it really does help with the impact assessment if that organization is doing like full-blown risk management and they plug it into their risk process and they see that this is like the highest risk on their radar at the moment. Um, the other thing
could submit the bug to the bounty program and then also write a blog post and put it on Twitter the same day. Um, so these are sort of like expectation building things that you want to look at the program and understand like what's acceptable for the program because when you open source that or open source that bug and submit to the bug bounty and make the same exact day before the issue is triage, you're basically zero daying us on that vulnerability. Um, so it doesn't really help us. <laughs> I mean, it helps us that we know, but we're a little bit high eight ball at that time, so it's really helpful to sort of be up front. Um, the other thing, uh, pay attention to eligible sites. We get a lot of people that submit bugs to us in like custom code application that's hosted on like someone's personal blog or their WordPress blog or whatever, and it, they're just not part of our program. So we get a lot of people that exhaust a lot of effort and a lot of time without reading instructions, and they they, they find bugs, but they find bugs in things that we're not willing to pay on that aren't part of our program. So if there's one thing that you think about as far as in instructions, make sure that you look at eligible eligible sites or eligible properties. And in most organizations or most bug bounty programs, you make that pretty clear. Uh, the other thing to consider is uh, the bug classes that organizations care about. There are some, some bug bounty programs don't care about like entire classes of certain vulnerabilities. And we have we have cases where we've seen where people will like exhaust as much effort as they possibly can to find a very specific type of exploit, and we're like, yeah, that's a, that's by design. Yeah, it's a wiki. You, know, you can have content. Um, so those are the sort of things that uh, we see. Uh, we do have a fact for our web bounty for when people are trying to learn those things. That that uh, image that I linked to you in the earlier slides. Uh, here's a link to it later if you want to check it out and see what guidelines we have with our program. Uh, this is an underrated one as well. Um, a lot of times we get people that participate in the bug bounty program and uh, they feel like they, they shouldn't ask questions or just simply don't. Uh, this is a really good way to get uh, good information about what's important to us. Um, and I think the, the big part here is context. Um, if you can understand that an RCE in this particular application is extremely important to us, and an RCE in this other application means nothing to us because it's completely isolated and completely segmented from our infrastructure. That's important information to know and it might help you as a bounty hunter target some of the work um, and some of the sites that you really spend your time on. Because time is precious, uh, so if you can find ways to save time and really target your efforts, you can, uh, you can get more success out of it. Uh, let's see. Oh, in addition to this, um, one of the things that we find a lot, of, a lot of good bounty hunters work with us on is that they find a vulnerability or they're looking at a public bug that we've already disclosed and publicly uh, disclosed and fixed, um, and they find other classes of bugs in the same place. Um, so in a case where like, there's an input validation bug and we didn't do a good job of actually solving that issue, we solved for the problem set that was, that was presented in bug A, and good bounty, good bounty hunters are going to look at that bug and say, I wonder if they did this, or I wonder if they looked at this, this aspect of it. So if you think about it, like uh, incomplete patches, uh, really interesting space. We have a lot of bounty hunters that, that do very, very well just by looking at bugs that we've fixed and maybe not completely fixed. Um, so I find that to be a very interesting category. Ah, so scared bug classes. Uh, this one's a fun one for me uh, because it makes my job more entertaining. Uh, you know, I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. They're great, um, and we'll pay for them totally. Um, they're not that interesting to me, uh, but they're interesting to organization. They're interesting to uh, certain properties that we have. Uh, in this particular space, we find where bug bounty hunters can be like specialists in a very specific type of vulnerability, uh, and especially in cases where that vulnerability is just not really well understood, it's not well documented, it's not a bug class that uh, other people are looking for. Uh, and we see bug hunters develop entire tool sets around these obscure vulnerabilities that like are really hard for organizations to really get their hand on, hands on. Um, and because of that, they do very, very well in the bug bounty program. Um, and one example of that, and I'll, I'll actually do a little bit more on it in a bit, uh, was hostile subdomain takeover vulnerabilities. Uh, 
Uh, sounds really bad. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of hostile subdomain takeover vulnerabilities. Okay, so like for you, this is good. Um, so this is actually a really simple vulnerability. Um, basically what it means is you've, you've taken DNS for a given web property, you've pointed it at a, a share hosting provider, but you haven't claimed the V host on the share hosting provider. Meaning that anyone that wants to show up on that V host provider can claim that domain arbitrarily and just take over all the content for that particular domain. Um, so the impact's really bad, uh, especially if that provider provides uh, SSL as well. So not can, not only can you spoof content, but you can spoof content over a valid certificate. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, that's a really interesting one. There's dozens of others, and if you can find your way as a bounty hunter into one of these niche spaces, not only will you do well in our bounty program, but you probably do well in other bounty programs as well. Um, so, in a way, you can take that one vulnerability and maybe sort of make the rounds for other organizations, and you can really clean up. And we've seen other bounty hunters do that. Uh, this one, uh, again, is another underrated one. I feel like these are extremely simple, but uh, they are key characteristics that define our good bounty hunters from our not so good bounty, bounty hunters. Um, just remember that, like, when you're when you're working in a bounty program, the person that that wrote that code, is eventually going to hear about that because they're the ones who are going to try and fix it. Just remember that when you're submitting, that you're being respectful, uh, and you're not going to sort of talking down, like, how could you miss this? Um, I, it's, it's fine by me because it's not my work that you're criticizing, but um, I feel like when, we get, when that message is delivered to a developer, they're much more likely to fix the issue if you're nice about it. Um, and we work, you know, as far as in the Mozilla bounty, our developers and the security researchers are working really, really closely together. So if you're if you're coming uh, if you're coming at someone really hot about them screwing up, um, well, we're going to put you right in front of that person. So uh, if you can be nice about it, you can build a relationship with that person and sort of build some goodwill to get things started. Uh, and it really sort of helps move things along. Uh, and, and I, one of the other things that, uh, that you're doing by being nice is that you build a lot of goodwill with the bounty team. So if, you know, there's a number of levels that, that you're working through with the bounty program, both from just initial valid verification of the bug towards the impact assessment, all the way to bounty approval. If you're nice and you've, and you've built up a reputation, those wheels are going to get smoother. Uh, we're going to know that you're this guy, and that we, we can trust your code, and we feel confident that you're not trying to swindle us, you're not giving us bad, bad POCs that throw shell on our machines or whatever. Um, you can really do some interesting stuff here, and what we do for people that are extremely nice and that are helpful, uh, and what we define as like good bounty hunters for us, um, they really help us shape our program. Like We ask them for input. We say, like, what's working? What's not working? Uh, is this is this a good way to handle the bug? Is this should we be doing something different? Um, and those people, we really we tend to ask the people that are extremely nice and not the jerks. So surprise. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about a success story. I'm gonna get a little bit of water because it parched again. Am I doing on time? Uh, Twenty minutes. Lightning. Okay. So I want to talk about a success story. Um, there's a guy by the name of Griffin Francis out of Australia. He's one of our, uh, what I would consider one of our good bounty hunters. And I want to share uh, a story about a bug that he submit that I, I ended up triaging. Um, it was kind of fun, and it does talk about uh, subdomain takeover, uh, hostile subdomain takeover. So uh, this is gives you a sense uh, for how impactful this bug was for us. Uh, so it affected 50 domains, so single, so subdomain takeover, we were able to take over a single domain, that's one domain. Uh, this guy found 50 of them. Uh, 50 domains that we had DNS pointing to a uh, VHouse provider. We were in the process of setting something up, but we hadn't completed the setup yet. And uh, this is basically the, the bug, it's public bug, so you can go out, punch that bug in and see the full details of how that bug was triaged how we worked with them, how we were able to solve it, and you know what the end result was. Even the domains that were affected. In this case, what was happening is 
we were building uh, an app framework that was going to be based on github.io. If you're not familiar with github.io, it's basically github pages. So the idea was is that you would host the application on GitHub, and then oh. you'd be able to deliver that application to Firefox OS, and you know everything would just sort of work. Uh, well, that was an idea. It was something we were prototyping, and we set up the DNS names in advance to sort of get things going. Uh, and what Francis realized is that, uh, or what Griffin found, was that uh, we missed a very important step of setting up that, which is the establishment of a C name. Um, in the case of uh, GitHub.io, this is how you claim a vhost. Um, so GitHub.io, they have a single server, or well, many servers, but like a single bit um, that's, that's stood up. And then when it comes in, it looks at all the repositories, and it looks to see who claimed a given domain. And that's how they would serve content. So if I don't have this file, what ends up happening is our bounty researcher in this case was able to go in and claim all those domains and stand up C names and make his own projects under that name. So what happens is, is that when you resolve one of these domains above, any of the domains that he shared with us, he can fully control that content and all he has to be is a GitHub user. Um, so again, bug bounties are interesting in the sense that um, you know, you handle traditional vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, all the sort of basic stuff. Uh, but when you get into like obscure vulnerabilities, it's really an interesting space because organizations just aren't prepared for it. They don't know all the nooks and crannies of all these different obscure vulnerabilities. There's generally not a lot of tooling around them. Uh, in the case of subdomain takeover, there's really poor tooling around all this stuff. Uh, VHOS providers generally don't uh, do any verification of domain claiming. Uh, so what was really great about this is that this was the first bug in, of many that we worked through to try and draw, address this within our organization. And I'm sure if you do any sort of like sub, uh, any sort of virtual hosting or shared hosting providers within your organization, this might be something to take a look into, see if you have old DNS records that are pointing to those DHOS providers. Or if you have DNS that's pointing to wildcards, or that's a, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, uh, talk to me after. I can tell you all sorts of forward stories about, uh, <coughs> about wildcard search. Um, at any rate, what I feel the reason why I chose this example, example is this is just one example of the beginning of a conversation that we had with a security researcher. And from there, we found tons and tons of more vulnerabilities after working with him having a successful result. So in my, in my vision, if you look at this bug, you can see um, this is an example of both of us doing the right things. And for me, when we do the right things, uh, when we as bounty operators do absolutely as much as we can to try and uh, remember what the incentives are for the people that are participating in the program, and if you as a bounty hunter can think about the incentives of an organization and why they operate the bounty program in the first place, you're going to be a lot more successful. And if we can take it, and if, and if there's a gap between developer conversation and security researcher conversation, if you can do anything to close that gap, you're going to be a more successful bounty hunter, just plain and simple. And those are the people that we really want as part of our program, and those people that we do operate with on a daily basis successfully to help secure a lot of our applications. So for me, it's just, okay, cool. So for me, uh, that's a really important aspect of it. That was the goal of my presentation, was the one leave you with uh, how to run a good op operation or how to operate a good bounty program. And hopefully I've given you some indicators of that. Also, for those of you out there, security researchers looking to be participants in a bounty program, hopefully I gave you a couple tips and tricks um, that you can use if you want to start participating. If you're interested in participating in the Mozilla bounty program, come talk to me after. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to find out what you're interested in. Uh, and maybe we can get a conversation going if you bootstrap. Um, that's really all I have for you guys today. I have, I think, some time for questions. I'm so glad that the speaker has calmed down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for talking about uh, it. It's more from the operational side. So, uh, that chart at the beginning, uh, you showed all the companies. Yeah. It's, it's obvious that there. Uh, Monthly large organizations, some of them even Fortune 500. So, for those organizations, it's usually easy to organize their own bar bounties from the resource perspective. Of course. So, if you could, what, from your experience, what's the number of 
internal resources that you think is enough to satisfy a certain amount of volume that is coming in? I think it depends on what your volume is. I can tell you that Mozilla, we have about, uh, on the web bug running side, I think it's like 40 to 50 properties that we have ineligible, which is, I think, a lot greater than most organizations out there. A lot of organizations really, really tightly scope their yeah. their bounty program. It's got to be in this application, this very subdomain. It can't be any of these classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, we operate a pretty wide open one, so I feel like we're more exposed in the sense that we deal with uh, a good amount of input from people. Uh, and Mozilla, we're not a big company, I mean, we're a thousand people, which is still a good size, but we're not like a you know massive giant. Uh, we operate the triage team with about five people, and the... And you're required to five people. Yeah, with, with a one-day SLA. So what's, what's the ratio between two and four properties? What's, what's the noise? What's the amount of noise? It depends on the researcher very, very much researcher centric. Um, so, like, if a researcher comes in, they read the program and they like they do the steps that I was describing. They tend to be really successful right off. Um, trying to think, we do get a lot of submissions yeah, I, that are like low quality. How much waste you have? How much waste you need to get rid of? I mean, mm. There's obviously a lot of noise because it's a public personality. I feel like we pay probably um, like maybe about half the submissions that come in, um, maybe more. Um, so it, I feel like we've got a good a good balance. Um, what happens with researchers that like what I would classify as not good researchers? They don't tend to last long because they're not being successful. Um, it, it's just one of those things like they're only willing to try for so long and then they go on and do other stuff. And then every now and again you get a couple researchers that are just trying to cut their teeth in things, and we try to work with them, but if, like, if they're not successful, they're going to peter out pretty quickly. So it's like, uh, that's why I think it's really important for, for people that are interested in bounty programs to get success early on, because it's going to help feed the, you know, feed that hunger to, to play along. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Is it like a burrito, or would you say that? 80% of the, or oh, 20% of the researchers would submit 80% of the vulnerabilities, or is it spread more widely? Uh, well, there's some that are really successful. Um, it's funny that you say that, because uh, from a quantity perspective, really, really successful researchers tend not to throw a lot of things in the wall. Um, every, most everything that our good researchers submit, almost all of it sticks, um, because they've done their homework, they've, done, they've looked at our guidelines, they've understand what we want. Um, I don't know if I quite answered your question. But more, have you seen is it the same student researchers that are um, submitting the majority of your uh, valid vulnerabilities? I wouldn't say that the, that it's the majority. Um, they're probably maybe ten percent of the overall. Like are really like regular people. Uh, we probably have like. 10, 10 people that are just like pretty solid that, that are mostly participating all the time. And then we have like a wide range of other people just kind of popping in saying like, oh hey, you know, there's new vulnerability at Nginx. Here's your, you know, here's your next thing to chase down. So. Any other questions? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a mini bug duplicates? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, we do have a lot of duplicates. Um, mostly bugs that are in process. So like, surprisingly enough, and it surprises me to this day, we, we do get like a, a, what I would call a birthday attacks, uh, where someone, you know, we go so long without anyone finding a given vulnerability, someone finds it on a Monday, and then some someone else, like completely unrelated, submits that bug on Tuesday, and it's like, how, we went that long, and like two right next to each other, and it makes you wonder, like, are these guys working together? Like, what's going on? Uh, but yeah, so we use a ticketing system, so in a case of Bugzilla, it's really simple for us to just be like, oh, that's this bug, resolve. Um, I would like to think that we have more, but I think we have such a, a wide scope that we support that generally people aren't tripping on each other uh, for duplicates. So if an issue is an issue, we're going to work through it to completion, and the idea is that we're, we're not going to see that bug again. And this is especially the case when you wipe entire bug classes off the map. Um, those are really helpful. So it's like, you know, you deal with it for so long and you're like, all right, we need to find a real solution to this problem. 
How much are you relying on your program for your own internal coverage of the applications? Um, and how much do you do internally to, to make sure? So, uh, so I joined Mozilla about a year ago uh, to help kickstart their program, uh, doing offensive testing. So I'd say that's getting to be greater. I think maybe two years ago they were relying on it more. Um, I'd like to rely on it less and have it supplement. Uh, just as a fair warning, do not use the bug bounty as the only thing that you're going to do for security. Uh, I, yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you're finding a balance. I think of the bug bounty program more of like a safety net. So do as much as you can with the resources that you have. And if you operate a bug bounty program, you're going to have a sense of whether or not you're keeping up with things. If you find yourself just like paying bounty after bounty and you're just like throwing a bunch of money out the door on the same properties over and over again, maybe you need to reassess the strategy. So what percentage-wise would you say, like resource-wise? Uh, I would say, I would say we think of it like maybe like an extra FTE or two FTEs. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> that's generally like where the payouts happen. <coughs> all right. Well, that's all I've got.